Thank you, Patsy. This morning we have Jamie Midkiff from the uh, from Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, that's where he worships at in Odessa, Texas, and uh, where his, his son-in-law is a pastor. That's a wonderful thing. But this morning he is here on behalf of Gideon's International. And the Gideon's International is a wonderful organization. I know that uh, uh, I used to be a Gideon, or W. Norris uh, is a Gideon. Uh, Bill Cummings is, uh, is a Gideon. And I know that uh, uh, Brother Jamie's going to also talk to you about how if you would like to be uh, a Gideon, uh, then he will visit with you on, on that as well. And you can talk to him after the service and uh, see if, uh, if, you, if God's calling you to do that, to go out and distribute uh, the Word of God around the world. He's going to talk about something that's pretty exciting to me, and that is, you know, sometimes we can't go out around the world. We can't, we can't go to, to Africa or the Middle East or wherever. Uh, and in our church, we can't do that. But what we can do is we can help support those that do. And the Gideon's International is, a, is an arm of our church. It's a missions arm of our church to be able to go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. And uh, uh, we do that through one way is through the Gideon's International. So, uh, Brother Jamie Midkiff from Odessa. <laughs> Do you believe in divine appointments? I know they have seen uh, many divine appointments. You know, God gives us divine appointments every day that we miss or we ignore or whatever. But a little more than a century ago, about 119 years ago, I believe firmly that God created a divine appointment between two total strangers, both Christian professional businessmen. These two men met while traveling on business and ended up sharing a common room for the night. And that night, those men also shared reading the Bible and praying together. From that divine appointment, more than 119 years ago, a great friendship began, but much more than a friendship began between these two men. Because you see, they ended up creating and beginning the Gideon International Ministry. <clears throat> this ministry has grown a lot over 119 years, made a lot of changes. But one thing that hasn't changed, we are still and always have been, always will be, a ministry that is completely, totally devoted to telling others about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. We do this by our own personal witness and by providing God's powerful, inspired, and errant word uh, to men and women and children all over the world. You know, the Bible tells us the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God promises us in Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return into me void, but it will accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I sin it. We live in a world today with more than 7 billion people. It's estimated that more than 4 billion, possibly more than 5 billion of those 7 billion people in our world today have absolutely no relationship with Jesus Christ. If Jesus were to return today, they would be hopelessly and eternally separated from the love of God. Jesus tells us in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but by me. I have no way of knowing how many people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior through the efforts of the Gideon ministry each and every year. But I do know millions upon millions of men, women, and children are given the opportunity to either hear or read the gospel uh, through our placements every year. You know, it took this ministry more than 30 years to place the first one million Bibles in our world in the Gideon ministry. Uh, up to date, there's been more than 2 billion New Testaments and Bibles placed. This past year, more than 82 million Bibles and, testament, and Testaments, New Testaments, were placed in more than 200 countries around the year. Uh, for vast millions of these people in our world today, a dollar and 30 cents is just completely out of their reach. Their income is a mere fraction of even a nominal income of ours here in America. If it's not for me, if it's not for you, they'll never own a copy of God's Word. And I want to thank you for doing that. One of the ways Gideon's places Bibles every year is we have blitzes, where in just a matter of a few days, thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of Bibles and New Testaments are placed. Uh, just a few months ago, 
In a blitz in New York City, more than 250,000 Bibles and Testaments were placed in one week. In this past year, over 600,000 real day in Rio de Janeiro in two weeks. Uh, a friend of mine, Odessa Gideons, went to Ghana, Africa, uh, in about a month ago, and placed him and 23 other American Gideons, along with a few Ghana Gideons, placed uh, more than 500,000 in two weeks. Many of those to young Muslim school children. We have the Blitz in New York City because of the size of New York City. We have the availability to have a Blitz there every year and place thousands and thousands of Bibles. Some people from Odessa, from the Odessa Gideon camp, go to that New York Blitz every year. And a couple of years ago, they came back giving me this testimony. One of the places that they went to place New Testaments one day was a nursing home. As they walked in the door of the nursing home, they located the manager and told them, the Gideons, we'd like to give each one of your residents a free New Testament. They were promptly told that that wasn't going to be possible because the nursing home received financing from the federal government. So they turned, as they always do, went out to the parking lot, they held hands, and they began to pray for God to make a way for them to put Bibles and New Testaments in the hands of these residents. While they were standing in the parking lot praying, the fire alarm went off in the nursing home. And each and every one of those residents were ushered out to the parking lot where the Gideons and Auxiliaries were standing there ready and willing to give them a free New Testament. You know, we have a, this is one of the things that got me into the Gideon ministry in the first place is the testimonies of people's lives being changed for eternity. Like Terry Hensley. Terry's life had hit rock bottom. She was sitting in her closet, scared to death of where her life was headed. You see, Terry was only 25 years old. She had three young kids. She had been married and divorced twice. She didn't even have a full-time job. And when she looked in the mirror, she said all she saw was a big loser. So there she sat, sat in the closet, desperate, with a gun in her hand, ready to end her young life. In a desperate plea to a God that she didn't even know surely existed, she cried out, God, if for some reason I shouldn't take my life today, you need to do something. Well, little did Terry know that God was already doing something before she ever stepped into that closet. Because you see, earlier that day, she sent the Gideons to one of her son's schools and he got a free New Testament just like this. And about that time that she made that plea to God, she heard her son come running into her bedroom hollering, Mama, I have something to show you. The little New Testament. She tells us that she's not quite sure what she read from, her and her son read from that first day. But what she does know, it was the beginning of a whole new life for not only her, but her family, because she came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen. One of the greatest blessings God has given me and us in the ministry is our relationship with our pastors and our churches, just like you. Without the financial prayer, uh, financial support and the fervent prayers from churches just like you, we would not be nearly as effective. You see, the, the finances, the, the funds from church services just like this provide approximately one-third of the Bibles and New Testaments that we place around the world each year. So thank you so much for that. As for you, by supporting the Gideon International <coughs> Ministry, if the pastor alluded to it, you can expand your witness exponentially by sending some 275,000 men and women into the world, telling millions about the hope that's in Jesus alone. For many, the church is given the opportunity to give financial support. When a Gideon like myself comes to visit once a year, for some of you, any who would, you can give any time to the Gideon card program. I, I believe y'all have the Gideon cards. You can, you can give a card and inspire, uplift a, a loved one, and as you give a card, you can send God's Word and change a life. <coughs> I'm often approached by people wanting to know, how do you become a Gideon? Well, if anybody's interested in becoming a Gideon, I'd be glad to stay and talk to you after the service. There are spiritual qualifications, of course, and professional qualifications, and everyone doesn't qualify to be a Gideon, but everyone does qualify to be a friend of the Gideons. 
A friend of the Gideons is simply someone who will willingly, faithfully pray and give financial support to the Gideon ministry throughout the year. Of the millions of Bibles and New Testaments that the Gideons place each and every year, I'm quite sure that a great many of them end up in a drawer, a closet, maybe even thrown away. But sometimes that seed lands in just the right place in fertile soil and somebody's life has changed for eternity. That's what made me want to become a Gideon. The testimonies. I've read and heard a tremendous amount of testimonies, some as simple as I remember getting a New Testament from the Gideons when I was in the fifth grade. That's the first introduction to Jesus Christ that I had in my life. I'm somewhat amazed. Your pastor is an example of this. At the number of testimonies from people being saved as a result of reading uh, 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 God play, or getting in place scripture and then giving their life to full-time ministry, such as your, your own pastor. Uh, has come out of the Gideons to become a pastor. Uh, many people uh, give their lives, their, devote their entire lives to, men, to other ministries such as being a missionary or an evangelist. Uh, many of them become Gideons. I'm here today to ask you to please continue your support uh, prayerfully and financially for Gideons International Ministry as we still reach out to billions more of men, women, and children around our world. And I want to promise you that as always, 100% of everything that you give to the Gideons International Ministry will go to the purchase and distribution of God's Word. The Bible tells us that the fields are white for harvest. The full extent to which these scriptures will impact lives uh, is unknown yet, but we remain joyfully and prayerfully confident in the promise that we're our work ends, God is able. I want to thank you so much for allowing me to be here today, and God bless you. Amen. Thank you. I'm excited about this morning. This morning we're starting on a brand new sermon series called Heaven. And the sermon series is going to be quite... Uh, quite uh, uh, quite a few Sundays that we're going to, to be putting together, uh, but uh, I'm very very excited on this. We're going to break down some some uh, some uh, uh, misconceptions about heaven, and we're going to talk about what heaven is all about. Uh, and so in this sermon series, in the sermon series based upon the Bible, and I've, uh, um, I've read a couple of books. I've read a couple of books. Um, one is a place called Heaven from uh, Dr. Robert Jeffress, and the other one's Heaven from Randy Alcorn. And um, I'm gleaning from those to be able to deliver the sermon series called Heaven. A couple of months, a couple of years back, uh, my family and I we went on uh, on a cruise, and and whenever we went on this cruise, we had to go through and and we were planned up. You see, I I'd gone through to see exactly what clothes I needed to, for our family to be on this cruise, what, what kind of, of passports and, and uh, other types of documents did we needed to be on this cruise. And we planned for months and months in advance to be able to make sure that we're all set to go. And, and we were a little anxious about it. Uh, but, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we had the right water shoes and that we got off and we were safe in all the ports that we were at and, and all the different countries that we embarked in uh, upon. And we had to, all of our documentation. We had everything lined up. And, and that was what a vacation was. And I, I would dare say that you too would go through your life and whenever you have vacations, you probably plan it out and you make sure you are planned ahead of time as to what it is that you need ahead of time before you get to that destination. This sermon series, we're going to be talking about something that is very, very important and a lot more important than a vacation destination. This is a one-way trip somewhere. And for Christians, it's a one-way trip to heaven. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about that this morning and the next several weeks as we talk about heaven. Uh, it's a sermon series called Heaven. Heaven, it's a real place. 
It's something very, very important to us, near and dear. You know, sometimes when we think about heaven or talk about heaven, you're going to do uh, the motions and you think to yourself, well, I, there's got to be a better place than this. There's, there's got to be something more out there than this. And, and we lament on various things. And we, we talk about uh, a place called heaven. And then there's all kinds of two to, there's a lot of misconceptions about heaven. And, and what are we going to do in heaven? I'm going to, over the next several weeks, I'm going to be talking about exactly that the very key questions on that is 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 there a place called heaven who's going to be in heaven uh, what will we do there uh, is is heaven right now a, a temporal place or an eternal place is is there there's something called an intermediate heaven right now and if so where is it at but we're going to be talking about all these things and answering these things. Will you, will you know your loved ones in heaven? Would, you, would people in heaven know what's going on back on people on the earth? Do we know what's going on when you're there in heaven? Who gets to heaven? Uh, those are all questions and more that we're going to be tackling during this sermon series. You see, ladies and gentlemen, for Christians, Christians, the eternal destination is heaven but only for Christians you see uh, whenever we read throughout scriptures we understand that that for Christians uh, God has given his life for Christians or for all mankind but only those that receive the free gift of eternal life have rest assurance in a place called heaven heaven it's a real place. There's many times that you talk about, the people talk about heaven, and heaven may be a, a state of mind, some people think. Some people have this, this destination that heaven is here on, on earth. I don't know why you'd ever think that, but some do. Heaven, is it, just a, is, is it a physical place? Is it a place uh, on earth? Is it just a state of being? Where is heaven? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that well, Scripture is pretty clear on this. Heaven is a real place. John, the 14th chapter, verse 2 and 3, says this. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. This is, this is Christ. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go to, uh, to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. The New Living Translation breaks it down like this and translates it like this. And I, and I love the language in this. It says this, and this is a quote for, uh, from, from the New Living Translation, John 14, 2 and 3. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If there were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare, prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I'm going to come and I'm going to get you. So that you will always be where I am. Isn't that comforting news for us? As a believer in Christ, that should be very, very comforting that, that Jesus Christ is, is going to take us to a place where He is at. He is going to be taking us up to a place where it's at. This place for believers is called heaven. That's where believers will go. Amen. In this sermon series, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see that Jesus is in heaven right now. And uh, uh, which we read here in John 14, 2 and 3 about this huge construction project that he's overtaking. And the size of this that we're going to read in the coming weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where Jesus is at right now. He's in heaven. Here's a scientific fact for you guys. Let me write this down. Scientific fact. 100% of people will die. One out of one will die. That's, that's a scientific fact. You don't owe me, owe me any extra for that. That's, that's, that's okay. But out of one out of one pe people, if we're all going to die, uh, let's talk about this, ladies and gentlemen. Death is inevitable. In Ecclesiastes, Psalms, uh, Solomon talks about this. In, in Ecclesiastes uh, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 12, Solomon writes, for certainly no one knows his time like fish caught in a cruel net or like birds caught up in a trap. So people are trapped in an evil time and it suddenly falls on them. David writes in Psalms 90, Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. 
Genesis 27, 2, uh, Isaac says this, I'm now an old man and I don't know the day of my death. Ladies and gentlemen, death is very real. It is very real. And C.S. Lewis uh, write, writes about it like this. He says, he says, for those that are focusing upon heaven, they make the biggest impact in this world that we live in today. But for those that are not focused upon heaven, they are not making hardly any impact in this world in which we live. So we, if we're focused and have our eyes set upon and focused upon heaven, what are we doing now to make a difference? What are we doing with our time? I would suggest that we need to make every good use of our time here on earth that we have because our eternal destiny depends upon it. We have just an opportunity to, to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior here upon this earth because when we die, it will be too late. You will not have a second chance when you die. When you die, it's appointed to, 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 you, to you to die once. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God has given us that free gift. And for all those found in Christ Jesus, heaven is the destination. Now, heaven, contrary to popular belief, heaven is not the default destination. Amen. You know, how many times have you gone to a funeral? Don't raise your hand on this one. And so-and-so is laying here in a box, and he was a dirty, rotten scoundrel. Vile. I mean, he was a horrible human being. And then you have somebody stand up and go, oh, oh so-and-so, he was the best thing since sliced bread. He did this and this and this. You know what I'm talking about. He, this person in here, the person, if you were sitting in the congregation here and, and, the, and, and the, 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 uh, the minister or whomever uh, might be leading the, 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 the service, uh, maybe a funeral home director or whatever, and they may be going all of this, the flowery things about, about the person here in the box. And, 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 and here it is, when you're out there in the congregation, you're going, is he talking about that guy? Because the stories are not matching up. I knew of so-and-so. That didn't sound like him. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we need to live our life on earth, our time on earth like we are saved. Romans 12, 1 says that. that we need to live our, life, our, uh, live our lives holy and acceptable unto God. We, we need to live like we are saved. We talk about that quite often. But then, ladies and gentlemen, when we die, we die one time. When we're on this earth, when we are all walking upon this earth, and my brother talked about it earlier, we have divine appointments. I believe that with all my heart. Those divine appointments that God uses us to, to reach in the lives of others. And quite honestly, somebody had a divine appointment with you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. That changed your life forever if you said yes to Jesus. Let me share with you a story of a man that I knew. His name was George Bagley. George Bagley was from Lumberton, New Mexico. George Bagley was a man that, that changed my life. He was a man that always had a smile on his face and the love of Jesus in his heart. Mr. Bagley, I, I, I'd call him Mr. Bagley. If he was here right now, he'd say, he'd look around and he'd say, I didn't see my dad around here anywhere. My name is George. George Bagley is my friend. George Bagley was, was instrumental in me getting into the ministry. He, you see, he saw something in a young Jimmy Crawford that Jimmy Crawford didn't see in himself. He believed in me. He felt like that, that God was talking to him to, to do something. And that is to start the process to get me ordained to go into the ministry. George Bagley was a man that he knew that his time on earth, because he, he got an illness and he died rather quickly, uh, but as a man that on this earth, he knew that, that his time on earth was short. But he made the most out of his time on earth. There's a lesson here for you and I. Our time on this earth is short. <coughs> we need to make the most out of our life. And the most, I'd submit to you, the most is found whenever we find Jesus first and foremost. That is the best thing that we have because death is inevitable. The second point I want to make this morning, ladies and gentlemen, the more we think about God in the next life, the more we'll be effective in this life. 
That was from C.S. Lewis. Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews 11th chapter, we all know this chapter. This is the, the Faith Hall of Fame. This is a, the stalwart for all those that are, that, are, that are found in the Old Testament saints. This is the, 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 the all-stars, if you will. Reading from Scripture here in Hebrews 11th chapter, uh, beginning with verse 13, says this, These all died in faith, although they did not receive the things they were promised, but they saw them from a distance and greeted them and confessed that they were foreigners in temporary residence on the earth. Verse 14, now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they are thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return, but now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them. The Old Testament saints, where are they? They're in heaven with God. They are in heaven with God. And we're going to talk about that in the weeks to come as well. The Apostle Paul talks about this, about, about the effects of this life being on the next life. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 6 and 7, says this. Paul says, so we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. In fact, we are confident and we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. You see, the Apostle Paul here is telling us a couple of things. He's saying, look, I would rather be in heaven with God. But since I'm upon the earth right now, I'm going to make the most of it. I'm going to walk my faith upon the earth. You and I, we long for an eternal home. We long for heaven. We long for a place called heaven. But before we get there, and until God calls us there, we need to make the most of our time here on earth. Not just simply abide by the time. How many times do, do you hear this? Or you see people get saved and it's like, okay, I'm saved. Now I've like somehow I've got my, my golden ticket. I don't have to do anything else. Well, I'm saved. Okay, great. What do you do now? Well, I don't do anything. Now I'm just, I'm saved. I already got my, my golden ticket. What else do I need to do? <laughs> Read scriptures. It tells you all kinds of stuff that you and I are to be doing. You just don't get saved and sit there like a bump on a log. Man, okay. you got to be active. Man. you got to be out working for Jesus. You are the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. Man, man. Philippians, the first chapter, verses 21 through 24, talks about this. Paul says here, For me to live in Christ and to die is gain. Now if I live on the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I, am, I long to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Paul is focused on his future home, but being effective in his present home. This gentlemen, focusing upon heaven reminds us on how brief our time here is on earth. When you think about it, when you read throughout Scripture and you and you see about how short the time that we have on earth is, and think about you, whatever your age is, I would dare say that any one of us, when you looked in the mirror, you think back upon your life, it just seems like just three or four years ago that you were 30 years old. Just four or five years ago until you were in your 30s. It, it seems like in your mind, your mind doesn't match what you see in your mirror in the mirror. You know what I'm talking about. You look in the mirror and your your mind has an age whatsoever. You still think of yourself in a certain way, and then you see wrinkles. You see gray hair, you see a body that has changed, you see something different than what you picture in your own mind. 
And then you think to yourself, where in the world did time go? Our son, Jace, is, is a senior in high school. He's our third. He's a baby boy. Here it is. He's fixing to graduate and leave. And I'm thinking to myself, where did time go? And we'll shed a few tears in the process. But time on earth is just a short, short brevity period of time, right? It's a brief, brief period of time. So what must we do, ladies and gentlemen, the short time that we're here, we need to make the most of that. We need to make the most of our life. You know, I said this a couple of uh, weeks earlier, and I got this from Brother Joe Wilkes, and we told, in the sermon series I was talking about then, that we need to stop and smell the roses along the way. We've got to focus upon heaven, but not neglect what we're doing on this earth before we get to heaven. James 4.14 says this, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be, for you are like a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Psalms 39, 4 and 5, Psalms probably David says this, Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days, so that I will know how short-lived I am. In fact, you have made my days just inches long. And my lifespan is nothing to you. Yes, every human, every human being stands as only a vapor. Some of us are a little farther along in life being called home than others. But the truth of the matter is, none of us know when our last day upon this earth is going to be. Amen. Not a single one. I don't care if you're five or 105. You don't know. So if we don't know that, but we do know what we should be doing in the meantime, because, ladies and gentlemen, apart from knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, there is no heaven. Now, by, by saying that, let me ask you this. Uh, do all people go to heaven? And, and it's the whole popular belief, as I talked about earlier. It's the whole popular belief is so-and-so's in heaven and so-and-so's in heaven. And you talk to everybody that's, di that's died, and I don't care who they are. Uh, they, they have not had any kind of uh, knowledge, uh, saving knowledge in Christ Jesus. Don't know anything about God. And, and, and you talk to that person, and then when you talk to them, they will say anything about their family members or whoever that is passed on and they say so and so's in heaven and so and so's in heaven and so and so's in heaven that would be fantastic if that was true but unfortunately Matthew 7 says something totally different unfortunately ladies and gentlemen not everybody dies and goes to heaven I wish I could stand here before you today, and it would but be a much more palatable message if he if he said, "Well, brother Jimmy, everybody goes to heaven because because so and so is a good person and a good person and a good person. Being a good person doesn't get you into heaven. You could be a fantastic. You can write this man a million dollar check today. That ain't gonna get you into heaven. Yeah. There's only one thing that gets you into heaven. And for some reason, ladies and gentlemen, on our earth, we seem to ignore that. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but people ignore getting on the airplane, if you will, to go. You can't just show up to heaven's gates and say, well, I'm here. Unfortunately, Jesus Christ talks about that in Matthew, the seventh chapter. He says, depart from me. It's going to be a sad day for a lot of folks, but a wonderful day for you if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah. A fantastic day. A wonderful, the best day that you can ever even imagine. In Scripture, ladies and gentlemen, we read in Matthew, the seventh chapter. See about the seventh chapter, verse 13 and 14. Do all people go to heaven when they die? The answer is no. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. 
For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Notice here, ladies and gentlemen, in Scripture, that there's a gate. And that gate either leads to eternal life or eternal death. It's a, it's a gate. Amen. It opens. You walk through. And I don't care if, if our society, if we believe that gate's there or not. I'm just telling you what Scripture says. You can say that there's no such thing as gravity and jump on an airplane. You'll find pretty out pretty fast that their gravity exactly works. You don't have to believe in it. It's inevitable, though. Amen. Standing before God's inevitable. There's certainly going to be a judgment for us all. John 14, 6 says this, And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Yeah. Hebrews 9.27 says this, It is appointed for, to, for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 11 through 15, says it so plainly. John got taken up into heaven and writes this down for us. Revelation 20, chapter verse 11 says this, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, for those or for whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no peace was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and Hades uh, gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, everyone, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Heaven is going to be a wonderful place. It's a place that, that God would desire for you to be in. God makes an offer to you, and you've got to accept that offer. It's like this, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I read of a story of, a, of this, it was this famous opera singer or so, and, and I can't remember her name, but she was some famous opera singer. You can tell how much I've listened to opera. <laughs> so it was this famous opera singer, and she was, was, uh, was uh, uh, at a, a wedding that she was invited to sing at, at the, at the wedding. And it was a real, real fancy place. Those things in New York, Chicago, something like that. Um, and so uh, what happened was this, this lady uh, was on the, the, you know, she was on, in the program. She, she actually sang at this really, really fancy wedding. And there was, a, 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 there was a huge reception afterwards, extremely elegant, right? And so what this lady did, the lady sat uh, in, at her place in the wedding. And then as she was, was there, she, she uh, uh, sang and did her part. And then after the wedding, they went up these, uh, uh, these uh, up to the top floor, and they had the wedding reception up there. And so as she uh, went up the elevator, and when the door opened, she was greeted by a security team. And the security team was taking everybody's names to make sure that they were written in this book. So the people before her, they would say the name and so on and so forth. And, and they would highlight the name of those that were actually showing up. And, and they'd welcome them. And they would go in into this really elegant reception. This lady and her husband showed up there. And the lady and her husband, what happened was whenever they, she, she showed up and walked up there, she said her name. And they looked upon this book and they were looking and they said well could it be under any other name she said no this is my name and 
Well, maybe try my husband's name, and they tried the husband's name, and, and neither one of their names were on the, the, the book. So the security team escorted them back to the elevator and escorted them down the elevator. And on the way to the car, the, the lady was, was, was perplexed. She's like, I, I don't understand. I mean, after all, I performed in the wedding. How in the world am I, am I not on the guest list? And her husband asked her, said, how did, you know, was, was, was talking to her and saying, why aren't you on that? I don't understand. And she goes, well... She said, and the husband said, did you get anything that would say that, you know, that you're in the way? She said, well, yeah, I've got a card that said that I need to RSVP. But I thought that since I'm in the wedding, I went to the ceremony. I thought that I would automatically be let in. Ladies and gentlemen, you could go to every ceremony in the heaven church, if you will. You go to every church service, worship service that you there ever is ever. You could hit eight church services a week. But unless you RSVP with God, unless you accept that invitation from God, and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, only then will you be ushered into heaven? You and I have a choice. And it's a free choice. God has given you an RSVP card, if you will. It's called Jesus Christ. And if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you cling on to Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then what you are promised is eternal life in a place called heaven. Now, it's not one thing that you just accept Christ and you just kind of like just, you, you kind of, you go through the motions of, I guess, if you will. God's not interested in you going through motions. You can sign the card and get dumped. That doesn't save you. Amen. It's only when you ex when you do a U-turn, and yes, that's a biblical term. When you do a U-turn, you walk from your old ways into the new ways, and you're walking towards God and saying, Lord, I desire to live for you. I want to live for you on this earth, and I want to make the best of my time here on this earth, and one day, Lord, I'm going to live with you in heaven. Amen. Amen. This morning with Stan. Patsy plays. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to, to just talk to God. And as you talk to God, I want you, I want you to thank Him for providing a way for you to go to Him. And then examine your heart. I pray that you have the love of Jesus in your heart, that you have salvation, and that you will be next to me in heaven one day. Not that I did anything, anything special or anything because I'm just filthy rags in God's sight, but Jesus paid it all. Ladies and gentlemen, I pray that if you're here this morning and you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, you're not living for him. I pray that today would be the day that you would change that. You would make that, that change, that U-turn, and decide to walk with Jesus. If you're here this morning and you're walking with Jesus, thank Him. Thank Him for what you're doing, He's doing in your life today. Pray for those divine appointments that you have today to make a difference in the lives today on this earth. And that one day, we will be with Him in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, maybe the Bethel Baptist Church needs where you need to call home. It might be you need to come to the altar and pray. But whatever your decision, this morning as we sing, you do business with God.